Greetings and welcome today to today's Ancient Order Hibernians webinar, Ireland's Future, Irish Americans' Role. Today, we have members of the board from Ireland's Future sharing with us, Chairperson Senator Francis Black, together with Professor Colin Harvey and Andre Murphy. Our National Freedom for Ireland Chair, Martin Galvin, is going to host and moderate the call for us. Martin? Thank you, Danny. Uh, 104 years ago, January 21st, 1919, the vast majority of elected representatives from a British general election that was one election for all of Ireland went to Dublin. And first thing that they did was to declare Irish independence, issue a declaration of Irish independence, which would apply to the whole country, declare freedom and independence for the whole country, and was designed to provide equal rights, equal opportunity, equal citizenship for all of Ireland's 32 counties. We know what happened. It was conflict, British imposed partition. And again, we've had successive periods of conflict. Almost 25 years ago, we had the Good Friday Agreement, which we honor the fact that it brought peace. But a central part of that peace was provisions that would allow Ireland to at last again be united in freedom and, and set down terms that it would have to do so, not in one election, but in separate referenda, one in the six counties, one taking place throughout the 26 counties. That provision right now, there are people working on getting that provision to work, to really deliver a united Ireland, to have those two referendum and to have majority votes for Irish independence in both of them. And the group, the driving force, it's an independent civil advocacy group between, that is driving that force is Ireland's future. We are fortunate to have three of the leading members of Ireland's future, the chairperson, Senator Francis Black, Professor Colin Harvey from Belfast and Andre Murphy also from Belfast to talk about Ireland's future and the fact America's role Irish America has been a key part of the Good Friday Agreement of all movements towards Irish independence. How does America, Irish American activists, help them, Ireland's future, and the people of Ireland to get that vote, those two referendums through the North and South, and to finally get the reunification that was declared 104 years ago and declared so many times prior to that? All right, we're going to begin with Senator Francis Black. Senator Black, uh, welcome. Uh, you're one of Ireland's well-known, best-known singers. You're an entertainer. You're a senator. You're somebody who was born in Dublin, lives in the South. Uh, why is it that you joined Ireland's future? Why is it that you devote the time and dedication to be its chairperson to lead the effort? Well, I suppose this is something that I've always been very, very passionate about. My father comes from North Antrim. Um, so I suppose down through the years and certainly to the 70s and 80s, you know, my father would have had a huge interest in what was going on in the north, even though we were living in Dublin. And we would have traveled a lot up to the north during the 70s and 80s um, with regard to and, and as, as children seeing, I suppose, the British army there in the north was quite like why you know why is there an army here when we're in it felt like us to us we were in our own country so there was always those questions that we asked and then it was back probably back in 2018 when um Niall Murphy and Jerry and I think Andre and so many others from Ireland's Future were involved in an event in the water in the waterfront hall in Belfast it was in relation to Brexit um, and they asked me to speak at that event. And I suppose that's when it all kicked off for me, where, you know, I met all of the organizers of that. And at that point, Ireland's future hadn't really um, come together. It was after that event and we saw the huge interest in this issue that we came together then and we, you know, built up this organization. They asked me to become chair and then we have people like Colin and, and, and loads of others and Andre and Niall Murphy and so many others, Martina Devlin, who are on the board and uh, Brian Feeney, many others. So it's it's been an amazing journey. And yeah, I look, we're, we're, an, we're a civil society organization that's that really just wants to work hard on, on planning and preparing properly for constitutional change on this island. So and 
you know, I can safely say we're guided by the Good Friday Agreement and we're dedicated to the to the promotion and protection of human rights and, and, and equality and obviously fostering mutual res respect between all views and traditions that share this island. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's been truly an honour to become to be asked to become the chair of it. Right. And how just generally, how does Ireland's future plan to get the pressure on the British to declare a referendum and to get the popular support north and south to win that referendum for Irish reunification? Well, for, for starters, I think, you know, what we've been doing is hosting events all over the country. Um, and really, our, our vision was to start off by hosting these public events where we could start off uh, the conversation because up to, I suppose, Ireland's future started to, you know, take action. Uh, we found that people were afraid to have this conversation. Um, so I think that was a, that was the beginning for us hold, holding these and our CEO Jerry Carlyle, who's you know who's doing phenomenal work for us. He's just unbelievable. He's a powerhouse, and Jerry is the one that's been driving all these uh, public events. So it's really to start the conversation, to get people, to encourage people to have the conversation um, about what they would, how they would like to see. Uh, constitutional change on on the island, but also about you know how did they how should we plan and prepare, um, and the fact that if we can drive this, we're asking our our Irish government to plan and prepare for constitutional change, and I think us having these events all over the country is definitely uh, I believe putting pressure on our government to plan and prepare, and they they're doing some work on it, but we'd like to see more done. Right now, as you say, you've had a number of major conferences. You had conferences in October and November and in Dublin and Belfast, major conferences. You had previous events. What do you think you've accomplished? What do you think that Ireland's future has accomplished thus far and, and that you're going to be building on in the future? Well, I think the fact, I mean, we had an event in the Three Arena last October where we had 5,000 people. I mean, it was record numbers. Um, to come to our event and you know i mean we have to face the reality that to a rising generation in ireland reunific reunification is the logical outcome of progressive movements working across our shared ireland for a better future for everyone and you know they know particularly that that rising generation that the evidence is, is clear that we'll be better off in new arrangements on this island and you know from our perspective ireland's future you know consider that any move to new constitution constitutional arrangements requires serious thought consideration and planning and that's what we've been doing you know and these events have been absolutely phenomenal we held one in, uh, recently in ulster hall and again jerry carlisle has been driving all these events it was sold out we probably could have sold out another night and people are hungry they're hungry for this dialogue you know and i'm talking about from all communities from all cultures, from all backgrounds, who want to have this conversation. Brexit has changed everything on this island, you know. So, you know, we we have kind of the the middle of the road kind of, you know, uh, people from the unionist background who want to have this conversation and who, who are hungry to have this conversation. So, you know, and even the political parties at our at our three arena event, we had every single pol political party present. Every single politi political party was invited and we had, you know, 90 percent of them of the parties there. So, yeah, and it was just really interesting to hear everybody's um, ideas on going forward. And from our perspective, you know, we believe in the imperative of conversation and, and of dialogue. And, and we, we really do acknowledge the different perspectives on our constitutional future. And that's an accepted fact, no doubt about it. But um, so, look, we're, we're just really bringing people together, getting people to feel more confident about the conversation. We're working on planning and preparing and, you know, for constitutional change, we'd love to see a citizens assembly going forward. And um, there's so much more I could say, but I'm going to leave some time for Colin and Andre. All right. And I know with all politics, um, politicians pay attention to their voters and you must be having a tremendous impact for the pe people on the ground, just for the politicians to be appearing. I just want to ask you finally, uh, this is about America's role, Ireland's future, America, Irish America's role. What would you like to see Irish America, particularly the activists like the AOH, like the other groups that are here that always work on believe in Irish reunification? 
work on all of the issues, whether it's legacy, whether it's Ireland's future, getting a referendum, all of those things. Uh, what would you like to say to them as they listen to this webinar today and talk about, think about the role of helping Ireland's future? Absolutely. We just would love them to come on board. Ireland, the Irish diaspora has been, you know, huge, has had a huge influence, um, particularly on Irish politics down through the years. And our politicians listen to the Irish diaspora in America. You know, they listen to America on many, many issues and they know um, how powerful Irish America are. And I think from from that perspective, we just need more pressure put on the political parties, uh, I believe, in general. And we just we need your support. We need you to be behind us. We need you to really get behind the work that we're doing. Um, and, and, and that's really it. And I'm sure Colin and Andre will have more specific asks. But from our perspective, we just need you to come on board, put pressure on our, I believe, on our political parties um, on really pushing forward this whole area of dialogue, of planning and preparing and I would love to see a citizens assembly and I think that's going to be vital for us going forward. All right, next we're going to go to Belfast and Professor Colin Harvey. And Col Professor Harvey, I'm going to ask you the same question I started off Francis with. Why is it you're in Belfast, you have a position, you know, you're a professor, you're a law professor, uh, you have a prominent position in the legal community. Why is it that you joined Ireland's future to vote the time you have. And, and we'll talk about some of the impact it's already having on you that, that uh, because of you taking this stand. Well, for, first of all, Martin, thank you very much for the, for the invitation to, to be here at this webinar. Very, very much appreciate the chance to, to, to have the conver conversation. But most importantly, although I live in Belfast, I'm from Derry. So I want that on the record. <laughs> This webinar so important, but um, no. Look, you realize very... you just got me in trouble now. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But uh, and rightly so, and rightly so. Um, look, the I'll, I'll be very, very simple answer. I was asked. I've always been committed to Irish reunification, but uh, my good friend and colleague Nal Murphy uh, Murphy asked me to sign a letter. And the letters that people will be aware of that were emerging after Brexit, where people were really, really deeply concerned about the impact on Brexit for people in the north of Ireland. And so I was invited and I was asked and, and I said yes. Uh, and the reason for that is really quite straightforward. Uh, I've always been committed to, to Irish unity, but there was absolutely no way that uh, I was prepared to be a bystander and stand on the sidelines uh, during uh, really what we're seeing as a, con a constitutional moment, a major moment for the island of Ireland. So in a sense, the reason why I got involved in Ireland's future is because I want to play my part. I want to be part of really what I think is a, is a, you know, a major civic movement for change on the island. And I want to emphasize Something, you know, Francis mentioned this as well, is that we're a team, we're a collective, and I'm one part of a bigger team, and we take care, care of each other, and we look out for each other, and we know there are people all around the world uh, supporting what we do, and that is tremendously heartening. But really, I'm, I'm here because I was asked, and because I want to play my part, and I want to do my bit, along with other people in the, on the island of Ireland, but all around the world, who really, really want to see Irish reunification happen. Now, one of the things in the Good Friday Agreement, uh, it says that the Irish people have the right to an aspiration to Irish unity, which uh, no one knew that we needed uh, an agreement to have that. But in any event, the Good Friday Agreement sets out that people have the right to advocate Irish unity. It sets out a legal mechanism for having referenda or doing that. Obviously, that implies the right to advocate for one side or another. Uh, there's a great deal of publicity and concern in the United States, particularly among the legal community, but generally, that because of you taking this position, you've been subject to a number of threats and harassment and, and someone who knew Pat Finucane, who remembers Rosemary Nelson, that's a very, very concern to me and to many of us in the United States. Could you tell us what has happened and why do you think it has happened to you? 
Well, first of all, and, and again, to echo what Francis has said about the framework, you know, our view in Ireland's future is that we are very much living the words of the Good Friday Agreement. We're taking those promises seriously in advocating in a civic organisation for constitutional change. But really, I, I don't want to focus on myself because in a sense, what we're seeing happening goes with the territory. So I don't take anything that's happened to me personally. I think people really are focusing on me to send a wider message. And it's not just me. Everyone involved in Ireland's future, including Francis and Andre, have found themselves coming under attack and scrutiny because of this sort of uh, work. So I want to keep the focus on the collective task that we're all involved in. Uh, we're all very, very familiar with the way the North works. And I think what's absolutely essential is that we're not derailed or distracted in a way from the work that we're doing and we keep focused on that. Because bear in mind, not, none of us are alone. And what's really, really been powerful being part of Ireland's future is that when any one of our team comes under attack, we're all there for each other. And we know not just as an organization, but, but we know there are people all over the world that are there for us and with us, whether that's, you know, in my own case, writing to my university to, to, to underline the importance of the work that I've been doing with others. Uh, so that's, you know, tremendously heartening. And I think that's where we, you know, we just need to keep focused on the work. We're on a pathway towards these referendums. These referendums are going to happen. We're getting ready. We're planning and doing the work. We want to see a Citizens Assembly set up There'll be people and there'll be negativity and there may be worse to come, but we need to keep our, you know, focus on ultimately the prize at the end of all this. Well, how do you, one of the things that Ireland's future is trying to do, one of its objectives, it's reaching out to the unionist com community to have them engage in discussion and possibly at some point to, to have support, increased support to help get the majority vote in the, the North uh, for Irish reunification. How do you reach out to them? I see too many times of people saying, well, we just won't do it. Uh, we won't discuss it. Uh, this is um, against unionism. So they won't engage in discussion and then say, well, now you can't go ahead with a referendum because you've never had engagement with unionists. How do you overcome that form of the unionist veto that you see towards any kind of movement or vote or, or referendum? It's a great question, Martin. Um, what we try to do is, is keep a focus on reality, on the facts and what's actually happening. And again, as Francis ma has made clear, people are engaging in the discussion all over the island of Ireland now. We have caricatures and stereotypes, but when you look at the reality, people from all communities and backgrounds are engaging in a discussion about the future. And in some senses, it's not surprising because I would say this anyway, but, but we've got the better option. You know, we're talking about a better, fairer Ireland that will be better for everyone. So in some senses, we've got all the advantages. We're, we're not naive and we know that particularly political unionism, we're extremely reluctant to engage in this discussion before a referendum. But the reality is, and we can only point to the reality, is we have people from a unionist background engaging in conversations with us. And we know that there are other conversations happening now, I think we should mention also the Brexit context. You know, what Brexit has done is that, you know, the North is now outside the European Union, even with the protocol, which is uh, mitigation. We are outside the EU. We have an automatic guaranteed re-entry option to the EU, and that radically changes this discussion. And it radically changes for many people in the North, the offer. Uh, Irish reunification now means uh, automatic re-entry. And for people, let's say from an alliance party background or from other backgrounds that see EU membership as fundamentally important to, to their identity and their future, then, 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 then that option is there. So I think that has changed the nature of the discussion. But people are engaging. We see it all the time. There are different conversations happening. And they're, they're not conversations that are easily captured by some of the old labels, either, to be candid. So, and I think we're encouraging those discussions. Right, now, finally, one of the main questions, um, under the Good Friday Agreement, there's supposed to be no external impediment on the choice that the Irish people make, so provided they make it in separate uh, referenda. 
Uh, biggest impediment is the fact that a foreign secretary of state, a British secretary of state, may decide he's the one person or she is the one person who decides when there is enough support to warrant the referendum, when to declare it. Uh, and uh, my own view is a bit cynical of how British secretaries of state operate throughout Irish history. But in any event, how do, can you get enough pressure on the British? How can Irish America help you put enough pressure so that a British secretary of state would one day say, uh, there is enough support. We are going to set a date for a referendum. We are going to let the Irish people have their say in accordance with the Good Friday Agreement. Well, Martin, you asked earlier what would be useful for people to do and, and some of the asks this evening. L let me put it like this. How can we seriously put pressure on the British government as a civic movement when the Irish government isn't putting pressure on the British government around this? If the Irish government isn't facing into this question, how are we ever expect a British government to do it. So I think it's absolutely right to keep the pressure on the British government around clarifying the criteria for referendum. And I've, like many others, done that myself. And, and I share your skepticism about British secretaries, States, British governments and all of that. So the pressure needs to be kept on the British government. But I do want to pose the question in this web webinar. If the Irish government isn't taking this constitutional imperative seriously, how are we ever going to persuade a British government to do it? So I think we also need to put pressure on the Irish government to do the preparatory work that we've already outlined. Why is this not on the agenda of the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference? There's a British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference recently. Why wasn't it on the agenda? So I just want to pose that question. Yes, put pressure on the British government and raise it there. But I think we also need to be putting pressure on the Irish government. These referendums are coming. Nobody wants to stumble into the shambolic mess that was Brexit. We want to get this right. We want to be prepared. So the Irish government needs to step up too. So I think there is a call as well as part of this to ask the question of the Irish government too. What is it doing to get ready? Is it even raising some of these questions in its conversations with the British government? So I think uh, there's a lot there to think about. All right, next we're going to go to Andre Murphy and the journalist commentator, somebody, one of the directors of Relatives for Justice, as well as a member of the Board of Ireland's Future. And Andre, you combine the perspective of someone who grew up in Dublin and now lives in Belfast. Uh, before we get into Ireland's future, just as a matter of great concern that a number of people are have asked to want to be updated on. Uh, this week, the British, we thought that the legacy law, the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Re Reconciliation Bill, the bill that would take away rights to inquests, rights to civil actions, right to ombudsman report, right to criminal prosecutions, as well as not establishing any kind of historical investigations. That is going forward. We thought that it had been halted, that the British were going to respond to the fact that it is no consent for it no support for it anywhere in Ireland. There's no consent for it, no support for it in terms of the UN, in terms of Amnesty International, in terms of the European community. But this week it's going ahead to a committee. What is the impact of that? What does that mean at this time? Hi, Martin, and thank you for having us on again um, this evening. I don't want to begin my comments without perhaps contextualizing and sharing with you that um, someone you would have met in Belfast and many of the peoples on this call will have met in Belfast a number of times, the Plastic Bullets campaigner Jim McCabe, the husband of Nora McCabe who was killed in 1981 with a plastic bullet, passed away yesterday. And you will have met him, you will have heard his testimony and that of his children, when Nora was killed, her children were very, very young and he raised them. Um, this legacy bill is happening and Jim McCabe has passed away without seeing any justice or any accountability for the killing of Nora McCabe. That is the context in which we debate this because every single day, another member, another elderly member of Elders for Justice will pass away and all of the victims groups and their children and their grandchildren will have to take up the fight for truth and justice. 
In terms of this week, you're right. We've had consecutive um, Brandon Lewis and then, forgive me, I can't remember the guy who was in between and now Chris Heaton Harris. We've had a few in very short period of time have said we're listening. We're in listening mode. We understand that there are all these objections. And yes, this week we've had the absolute insult of being written to by the current Secretary of State saying we've listened, we've made some changes and we're pressing ahead. And so this week, the um, absolutely not changed Legacy and Reconciliation Bill, which has no changes in it, except to make it even worse if it was even possible by tinkering around the edges and make it, and saying we will introduce some investigations when we think they should apply. So they will introduce a two tier system where if the British government fancy doing perhaps some investigations, they might do them. And so some families will not be, will be sitting without investigations. And I have no doubt the majority of families and some families might see some investigation. Total mess. That's going through the um, House of Lords now. It's been reignited and going. The committee stage will happen on the 31st of January. So next week fish. And um, then it'll go through the House of Lords and then it'll come back to the House of Commons. And we've been absolutely assured it will progress and it will be in place by June. So, as you say, the unilateral approach of the British government is completely out of step with the Irish government, completely out of step with every single one of the local political parties and all of the victims groups. It is progressing. We have families who are ringing us now saying, my inquest is due to start in April or in May about killings that happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. And they're saying, do you think this is good? Are we going to get in the door before this becomes fact? And the answer is, we don't know. We absolutely can't assure anyone that if they're starting um, a preliminary hearing this week, as there is with the killings of Jack McCurney, Kevin McCurney and Theresa and um, uh, the, the foxes who were killed in the Moy that you will all have met when you were over on your last trip. That, those inquests are starting tomorrow with a preliminary hearing. We have absolutely no idea if that's going to reach to full inquest. Can you imagine what it's like for Bernie McCurney, who saw her parents killed, her husband and her uncle killed? Can you imagine what it is like for her to be sitting tonight looking at all of this? Because we can't give her any answers. There's no certainty at all. So that's the legacy landscape at the minute um, and it's it's just very uncertain and very very bleak but I have to say this Chris Heaton Harris is coming over to the United States this week and you know he is coming over to try and say we're a little bit different now all of that bad will to the previous administrations where it was all a bit bad around the protocol um, and with Irish America in particular he's going to try and warm up that environment I know that you won't allow him to get away with them um, with just giving a bit of plaw moss and not being very, very particular about what their plans are, because the plans are just as desperate today as they were with Brandon Lewis 18 months ago. The legacy bill itself, it's a, a classic example, like Brexit, like so many other decisions in which British policies are made at Westminster to suit the interests primarily of England, regardless of what happens in the north or even to a lesser extent, regardless of what happens in Scotland or Wales, is there any impact on unionists, the fact that they would see so much more authority and representation in a 32 county Irish parliament making decisions like that for their own benefit, instead of just, as they will say, getting let down by Tory government after Tory government or being sold out at the pass and still wanting to have that government support them in, in oppose a referendum. Does that have any impact on them? Is that argument being advanced at all? So when Colin and Francis were talking about people who are from a traditional Protestant, traditional unionist background, being very engaged in the current conversation around constitutional change, that is exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about people who are saying, well, where is it I can actually have influence? Where is it that decisions will be might be taken in my interest? When we made the decision that we did not want to come out of Europe, and yet Westminster took us out of Europe anyway, 
when the local parties and local people said we don't want a legacy bill and we had it imposed on us anyway it told it it, it put into sharp relief the democratic deficit that exists currently and devolution can, doesn't make any difference to any of that so the, a new conversation began around that and it is absolutely scoping out well could i have confidence that my democratic wishes would be observed, that I could go back into the European Union. And also my human rights as someone who is Protestant, who is traditionally unionist, who sees myself as British, will I be protected or will I be affected by discrimination? Those very reasonable and very honest questions are absolutely being debated. So in the Ulster Hall in particular, in our last day of public meeting, it was extraordinary to hear a Fine Gael councillor, Lorraine Hall, talking about being Protestant in Dublin and talking about how she is absolutely Protestant and absolutely has that affinity there. And yet she can express her express her Irishness, be engaged with the GAA, speak the Irish language be part of the education system and have her identity intact. And she was able to assure those from a Protestant unionist background that it is currently happening in the South. And so our conversation now needs to go to how ensuring we, we protect the human rights of all citizens. We have to bear in mind, it's not just unionists and Protestants. It is also about the new communities that live on this island with a growing number of people who maybe came from other countries and now find Ireland is their home and their children is absolutely their home. How do we ensure that our debate is inclusive and protects all of those rights? <coughs> just, I did want to mention, you'd mentioned American reaction to legacy. There has been a major congressional letter this week, was spearheaded by Congressman Boyle, Congressman Fitzpatrick, Congressman Keating, but they were joined by 24 others, 27 signatures. It was done over a day or two. It's one a very lengthy, I think we're going to post it on the webinar, just on the link it, a very lengthy and very strong and articulate criticism of the British legacy proposals. And it was directed, if you look right at the British prime minister, normally diplomatically congressional letters were sent to the British ambassador. That was the channel because of the strength and urgency of the protest and the strength of the issue. These congressmen sent it directly to the British prime minister. And what I wanted to ask you, Andre, is how important Irish Americans, many of the Irish American groups on this webinar contacted their local representatives they got them involved uh, they were aware of the issue some of them others are just doing it because they were educated by irish american constituents how important are letters like this to you do you think they are in terms of people who are afflicted in terms of legacy people who are working for ireland's future when you see congressional support like that as a result of Irish American action, how important is that to you? On legacy, it is the only thing that is making a difference. The United Nations have written multiple times to the British government and said they're in default. The European Commission has done exactly the same. The Irish parties have done exactly the same. It doesn't make a jot of difference. When Irish, Irish America, and in particular, the representatives in the Congress and Senate write, it makes all the difference in the world because that is when we see the strength of Irish America. And when it roars, it is absolutely paid attention to. In terms of what Francis and Colin raised, you know, it, there has been so, like consistent, consistent um, talk about how a united Ireland or constitutional change has to be planned and has to be worked out. We've talked about that since the day and hour that Brexit happened. That's seven years ago now. And yet no planning and no scoping has officially been done. Once the call from Irish America and from the and from the representatives in America start to happen, that will change the debate on the constitution in Ireland. It comes back the way and it makes all the difference in the world. But on legacy, what I'd say is all of your work has made the most phenomenal of difference. Right now, we are still in the state of emergency. And we still need that concentrated support. Every single family needs you. And, and I can't overstate it because it really doesn't matter what happens on this island. The British government isn't listening to anyone and no one on the island of Britain cares. Your, your care makes all the difference in the world. 
right? And how would, in the context of violence future, how do you see the issue of legacy being dealt with in a just matter that could give truth and a measure of justice to everyone who's been afflicted? You know, that's a really complex question and is something that I think many people will kind of stand back from. And I'll give you an example. At the Three Arena, um, and I'll speak really frankly about it, um, at the Three Arena, there was a concentration on let's look forward, let's look to the future. And so that merely says to people who've suffered violations that will be gone and that will be over, but we know that won't be the case because those hurts, those travesties, those violations will carry on into a new Ireland. And, you know, people will appreciate it in New Ireland as very different depending on who affected them. So if you are affected by the British government, you will worry if I'm not in the jurisdiction anymore and I don't have domestic remedy, will I be able to get the files? Will I be able to get the accountability if we're no longer part of Britain? And you can understand that that's a real challenge and it would have to be worked out. If you've been affected by Republican violence, you might be saying to yourself, a New Ireland would vindicate the harms that were inflicted on me and my family. And for them, that's going to be a particular issue for them. We as an organization and as a community who are debating this will have to be really focused on how we can ensure that those who've been most harmed by partition and by our past are protected and their rights are protected, their human rights are protected in this. And we don't pretend that it isn't there. We don't say we'll drop. We have a new process of drawing a line under the past. We bring the past with us. We ensure that we care for victims and survivors of human rights abuses. And in the negotiations that will come but around new constitutional arrangements, we ensure that files and accountability are part of that process so that families can have truth and justice going forward. And part of the legacy bill is that there will be a destruction of files. It's actually one of the most pernicious parts because if this process fails, which it will, other processes will have to come. If the British government has systemically destroyed files, that will make a massive difference to the potential for future for the future for victims and survivors. We have to ensure that those files are protected now for the future. And if we're talking about new constitutional arrangements, we'll have to do something similar. It's a really complex part of the negotiations. But let's start talking about it now rather than making it something we forgot about and we have to repair in the future. Right. Uh, Danny, when I, we were preparing for this webinar, uh, Francis and everybody told me they just wanted to speak to the Irish American activists. They weren't going to ask, make a financial appeal. They wanted to, to let us know in Irish America what they're doing and what how important our role is. But I've gotten a couple of texts from people asking how they could contribute. Could we ask Francis or somebody before we go around how they could contribute financially to Ireland's future? That would be fantastic. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Martin. And yes, um, always, you know, as you can imagine, funding, you know, to keep Ireland's future going is always a cha very challenging for us. Um, we do have a patron scheme um, that we would ask people to donate, um, you know, privately, personally, on a monthly basis. Um, and if they wanted to give us a large donation, they can do so as well on our website, irelandsfuture.com. Um, that would be very, very helpful, and I appreciate you uh, giving us this opportunity to be to to ask around the funding because it's absolutely vital for us. And um, we're hoping to get the five hundred one as well uh, in the US. We're working on that at the moment, but for the moment, for us, private donations on our website would be very much appreciated. Um, and also, can I just say um, there was two other board members that I didn't forget about about i was just a bit panicky there but we have patricia mcbride and stephen mccann so i've mentioned everybody there who we all do phenomenal work but we also have other people involved in ireland's future who who are very passionate about going forward on 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 on, on what we're trying to do and um and to bring as many people with us but we really do ask ireland america the irish america to get behind us now and really be there for us and support us in every way we can so thank you so much danny i throw it back to you uh, thank you, uh, Martin. Before we go to Sean Pender, our national vice president, I want to let everyone know in the chat, you could find the uh, Boyle letter. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, Congressman Boyle and Congressman Fitzpatrick uh, are both two of the key sponsors of that, along with Keating. But I want to point out that uh, 
Boyle and Fitzpatrick are both members of the Ancient Order Hibernians in America. So that letter you could download right from our chat. And Chris Cook uh, has taken the time to put the direct links to Ireland's future in the chat as well. So if you go on there and click on those uh, pages, both their uh, web page as well as their YouTube channel, and we ask everybody to um, join our YouTube channel and also join the Ireland's Future YouTube channel. Vice President Sean Fender. Thank you, Danny. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for putting together such a great thing. Uh, another one of these great webinars we hear so much good about. And uh, for uh, our, our leader on this cause, Martin Galvin. And I just want to start by what, following up on Andre. I, I, I had the great uh, opportunity to meet Jim McCabe on several uh, occasions in, in Ireland. And uh, when I learned, it was one of the first cases that I learned about, and it was uh, just really unbelievable what was what was done to that family. And then they hid behind the fact that she was somehow responsible for that. And, and I think what was even more powerful uh, on the second or third time I met him, I met the, uh, I believe it was the youngest daughter who was only three months old when her um, when her mother was killed uh, by a, a rubber bullet. And uh, now her father has passed and she, she basically uh, takes up that struggle to uh, for a mother that she unfortunately never had the opportunity to, to know. So please pass along our condolences to the McCabe uh, family. Um, I just want to compliment the whole Ireland future and the work that they have done and, and how this has come out from a real uh, um, groundswell of support. Uh, you know, uh, when you listen to what they've talked with Francis and Colin and Andre, this is well thought out of. This has been planned. Uh, this has been inclusive. They have looked at this from legal aspects, economic aspects and social aspects compared to th this to a little thing called Brexit it was probably the worst thing that ever came about. It was passed and no one to this day, seven years later, has an idea how to um, how to implement that. You compare that to an event that I followed online for Ireland's Future, which made up of a panel of 100 percent of people from the unionist or Protestant community. And it included open, frank discussions along those lines we talked about before. But it, it showed that they wanted to hear all the voices. There has been a considerable amount of talk that's gone into it. There's a considerable amount of dialogue and and planning. And I think it should be no <clears throat> surprise that a lot of this has come from the nationalist Republican community, that in the 25 years since the signing of the Good, right, um, Good Friday Agreement, they have consistently lived up to their obligations and commitments, in spite, despite the fact that many times that goal line was moved and they always had to do more. And that line in the sand was moved and they, and they consistently stepped over that. And they did it not just for their own community, but the better for the entire of the society in the North and other places. Now, let's compare that to unionism, who still say no to governing, no to sharing, no to planning. They don't have a plan and they don't want to engage. So what we really need to do in part of our discussion is stop appeasing the DUP. OK, let's call it for what it is, which is basically discriminatory, prejudicial and obstructive uh, uh, planning, a lack of planning. Uh, to not deliver for none of the people uh, in the Ireland. They can't deliver to their own. So if we try to take a look and plan uh, for all, see what we're up against. We're up against the British government who wants to cover up the past and the DUP and others who want to live in the past. Compare that to the inclusive voices of Ireland's future and the choice on who to support is an easy one. It's time for the Irish government to get fully on board and for Irish America to learn more about Ireland's future and support their work for a free and united, inclusive 32 county Ireland. So I commend the work of the great things that Colin Francis, Ireland's future. Uh, please give my best to my good friend, Niall Murphy. And of course, to continue, we will continue to be a voice. Danny and myself are back uh, with uh, Liam this week from uh, Washington, D.C., where we spoke uh, <laughs> the truth to power in D.C. with the uh, Irish government and our government regarding the importance uh, uh, of legacy. So thank you uh, for all the work that everyone has done on this uh, webinar. Thank you, Sean. And we also had the opportunity to speak with Congressman uh, Joe Kennedy, the new um, special envoy to the North Ireland. We're going to be meeting with him again next week. And we expect really great things um, to come in that relationship. Sean Pender, uh, for those of you who don't know, was a longtime Freedom for Ireland chair for us, 
has uh, really led tremendous um, fact-finding missions over to Ireland. Um, in the old days, we focused more into North Ireland, and now we also make sure we stop at the steps of the Dublin government, and we work very hard there. Um, our Christmas appeal uh, is in the concluding moments. So uh, I remind all our members on that the links for the Christmas appeal are on the front page of our website, uh, AOH.com. Martin sent out a lot of reminders. Um, I'm so proud that the ancient Orhe Hibernians had a record setting collections uh, throughout COVID. When a lot of people thought they were going to close the doors and groups were uh, going under, uh, taking a hiatus, so to speak, the AOH really stood up. Um, we continue to make our donations. And I remember some of the groups, uh, uh, some of the cross uh, community groups talking to us about how we allow them to simply keep their doors open and their lights on uh, during COVID. So we're so proud of that. At this time, we're going to go um, in reverse order through our guests, allow them to give closing comments. And when Martin uh, closes the event, uh, Senator Black has uh, given me permission to show a YouTube video of her performing Foggy Dew. We close often with Foggy Dew, and I can't think of a better way to close this. So make sure you stay on the line here today. We have, uh, we've had a total of 157 people on. A few have left and come back and forth between our webinar as well as our YouTube page. So we're very excited for that. And I'm going to go right back uh, to Audre Murphy. Audre? So um, all, all of your members, and I know the AOH in its massive commitment to the Good Friday Agreement will be marking the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement this year. You know, within that, we've seen and Sean Pender re referenced it, how we've seen the Good Friday Agreement undermined in so many ways. We are the protectors of that. We're the, you know, Irish America was so important in ensuring that the Good Friday Agreement could happen at all and that it's protected in its entirety. I think that that needs to remain, that that that, that candle that was lit that day that said peace is possible, understanding and reconciliation are possible, but it takes hard work. No one can walk away from it and human rights are the bedrock of it and no one has the right to take that away from us. Thank you. Uh, Chris, would you repost the uh, congressional letter? Um, I think a uh, couple of individuals had a hard time uh, getting it. Uh, it should still be there, but we're going to repost that right now. Colin? Just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to, to talk to you all. Um, this evening here, this afternoon, uh, for many of you. Really, really appreciate that chance. Look, I just want to say that ultimately now, in the long running collective uh, movement really for constitutional change, the finish line of this project is in sight. I think we are essentially on the last lap or whatever other analogies you want to use uh, where I think we're heading towards these referendums taking place and where Irish reunification is a real uh, possibility in the time ahead. And we very much want to get this right. And we want to do this together. Ireland's future is just one part of a wider, uh, in a sense, glo global movement for change. You know, while people will often focus on the negatives and it'll be a hard road and it has been a hard road, um, People will be dancing in the streets all over the world and in many cities in the US when this happens. So we're all part of it and we very much appreciate your support. And I just want to end with an ask. There'll be a lot of people all over the world uh, acknowledging the Good Friday Agreement, celebrating the achievements. It's absolutely essential that constitutional change, Irish reunification, the message of planning and preparing is not left out. I think a big concern I have is that people sometimes want to talk about everything else but a new and united Ireland. So we have to work very, very, very hard to make sure that the proposals we've made around the Citizens' Assembly, uh, you know, the constitutional change is in those statements when they emerge in April and May of this year. So I think that's, that's a big ask. 
because I think there is a real risk sometimes, as we all know, that, that people don't want to talk about this conversation, but we very much do. Um, we hope that you, we know that you do as well and will support us in that. So thank you all very much for the opportunity again. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, for your time today. And uh, Senator Black. Thanks very much. And thanks very much. And I too want to just really thank you for this opportunity um, to let all your members know and Irish America know about the work that we do. But if we could just take a moment or just take a minute to to imagine a new Ireland, you know, the opportunity to create something better and, and an opportunity to reconsider the social contract and shape the country in the way that we want rather than the one that we have inherited through trials and tribulations of history. I mean, part of imagining a new Ireland has to include acknowledging and, and accepting different identities and acknowledging the fact that despite having different identities, we have commonality of citizenship. And, you know, the discussion around identity has for the most part focused on a binary two traditions narrative, but that's something that we now really need to expand on. So, look, I just want to say, you know, recently when we started off, you know, we we often had criticism of those who were saying that, you know, any debate on possible future reunification was in itself divisive. And I just want to, I suppose, say that, you know, I think those people need to be reminded gently and firmly that seeking to close down this debate is an attempt to, dis to silence legitimate political aspirations because talking has never hurt anyone. And that's what we want to encourage, lots and lots of dialogue. And that's what Ireland's future is all about. So thank you so much. We, we really appreciate your support. Thank you for allowing me to, you know, mention the piece around the funding because it is very, very important to us that we can continue to do this very, very important work. And um, thank you. I can't thank you enough for, t for this evening. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, if this, I think we might have found a new time spot. I don't know whether it was a group or our timeline, but we have a tremendous audience today. We're very excited with that. Martin Galvin, your closing comments. Two things, Danny. Number one, you know, when you talk about the Good Friday Agreement, one advantage of being as old as I am, as I can remember, the role that Irish America was playing when we were talking about in 78 or 79, a visa for Sinn Féin and for Jerry Adams, which nobody thought would happen, or John Deere, a member of the AOH, an assemblyman started saying, we need a special envoy to go over to Ireland and try to forge an agreement, and how that this was ridiculous, and it took years. But Irish America, the groups here represented on this webinar, were the ones who pushed it when no one would. They put it on the agenda. They got it on the presidential agenda so that Bill Clinton would have to take those questions and made those commitments. And everything that we're going to celebrate came about, really started with Irish America, the group. So never forget, never underestimate how important you are out there listening. And all that these people are talking about is just simply that the decisions for all Irish people being made by Irish people in Dublin not being made in English interest where Ireland doesn't really matter at Westminster for six counties and then the impact that that has with things like Brexit in the 26 counties. Irish America has always pushed Irish reunification. These people want to make those provisions of the Good Friday Agreement a reality. They don't want to see this as just something else that never happens. They want to see it be a success, a final success. And I'm grateful that they spoke to us. Coming on shows how important we are. Let's support them in every way that we can. Thank you, uh, Martin. I'm, and I'm Danny O'Connell, president of the Ancient Order of Hibernians in America. We are the largest Irish organization outside of Ireland. We are so proud to have members from all 50 states. And today I call on all of our members to step up, speak with your Congress representatives, speak with your senators. Regardless of party, the Ancient Order of Hibernians is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support any party or any candidate. We do not oppose any party or any candidate. These are the issues of the Ancient Order of Hi Hibernians in America. And we have a constitutional charge to continue to work for free in United Ireland. With that, I'm going to move 
to our close, where we're going to have a special treat hearing uh, the senator perform Foggy Doo. Thank you. Twas down the glen one Easter morn to a city fair old There are armored ranks of marching men. In squadrons passed me by No fife did harm No battle drum Did sound its loud tattoo Jealous bell, or the living swell rang out through the foggy dew. Right proudly high over Dublin town, they hung. Flag of war. It was better to die neath the Irish sky than at Suvla or Sudelba. And from of royal me strong men they came hurrying through while Britannia's hearts with their long range guns sailed on to the foggy All nations might be free, but their lonely graves are by Suvla's waves or the shores of the great North Sea. Or fought with Cabra Their names we will keep Where the Fenians sleep Neat the shroud of the foggy Thank you.
all for joining us.